So welcome back everyone. I hope you all had a nice lunch and that you're all feeling well fed and rested. So we now have the second of today's invited speakers. And it is a great pleasure to be able to welcome uh, Shannon O'Loughlin and Colleen Medicine from the Association on American Indian Affairs, who have been extremely kind in joining us at 7 a.m. their time. So we will be gentle <laughs> with you, don't worry. It's early in the day there. Um, the Association on American Indian Affairs is the oldest nonprofit in uh, serving Indian country since 1922. And it has built a national and international effort assisting Native, Amer uh, Native nations in the United States with domestic and international repatriation. Uh, Shannon O'Loughlin is a citizen of the Choctaw Nation uh, of Oklahoma and is chief executive and attorney for the Association on American Indian Affairs. She's been practicing law for more than 20 years and is also a lecturer at John Hopkins University. She's a former chief of staff to the National Indian Gaming Commission and has also served Indian country in the private sector as an attorney. Shannon was appointed uh, to the Native uh, American Graves Protection and Repatriation Re Act Review Committee in 2013 and was appointed by President Barack Obama as the first Native American to the Cultural Property Advisory Committee within the State Department in 2015 and she was removed from that position by President Trump in 2019. So Shannon received her uh, BA in American Indian Studies from the Californian State University, Long Beach, and has a joint MA and JD degrees from the University of Arizona in Indigenous Peoples Law and Policy. So Colleen Medicine is a citizen of the Sault Ste. Marie uh, tribe of Chippewa Indians, and has her family roots that they uh, come from the Mackinac Island in Michigan. Colleen has spent her entire career working in Indian country and has served several positions within tribal governments and nonprofits. She has extensive experience working in repatriation and sees no greater honor than assisting with the return of ancestors and their objects. She has a master's degree in international administration with a focus on international repatriation from Central Michigan University. And most recently, she served uh, the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Ch uh, Chippewa Indians as the director of language and culture and as a NAGPRA designee. So Colin and Shani, Shannon, <laughs> Colin and Shannon, wonderful Irish names, by the way, are going to uh, talk to us today about uh, how care and sustainability can be achieved through repatriation and truth telling. So the floor is yours and you're most welcome. Me Gretch, thank you. Um, well, I, I've been told a few times by my elders, whenever you talk about repatriation issues or issues that affect our people in such a profound way that we start with a traditional greeting in our own language, um, just to let spirit know um, what we'll be talking about today. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And of course I'll translate afterwards. So, Ani Bojo Wapshka Sinikwe Indigena Kras, Segena Indonjaba, Karbzagagim Mompinida, Dangebam Kak, Makana Menacing, Michigan Dodam, Ojibwe, and Ishnabi Queen Dao. I want to say, Miigwech, Bindige, Mompi, Nongum. Um uh Miguech a Gichi Money do Minu a Bejo Gitu Money do Minu Miguech um Wabanong Jawanang Gabinang Boydanang Minu Miguech Ishpeming Shakumakwe Minu Miguech no Kamasanic Minu Miguech Mishoma Sonic Minu Miguech Nibish Miguech Gete Inishnabek Minu Gete Inishnabek Mampi Nungum Um Um Miguech Inishnabe Bamansum Um Miguech um Kinigego Gimijong um, Mont P and um, Minoa um, Miigwech um, uh, Kinawaya Mont P. Um, so um, what I was saying there was just introducing myself, but I was also thanking all of you for coming today, for being here in this virtual Zoom sphere with us and um, thanking your spirit for showing up and thanking the ancestors, the ones who've come home, the ones who have not come home yet. Um, and thinking all of the four directions and all of the lands and all of the worlds, <laughs> wherever we might be coming from today, 
um, so that we could start off in a good way and um, and let spirit know that we'd be talking about repatriation and some of the important issues that come with it. So, me um, Gwetch. Um, do we want to talk a little bit about the association and then move in to the rest or do you just want to jump in, Shannon? Let's jump in. Um, uh, I think we're ready to go. All right. Well, um, in thinking about um, repatriation, I think it's always important for me um, to share a little bit about what happens in community, in tribal community, in our native nations when our ancestors and objects are not returned. And so what's going on in our community that makes it so important that we fight for these things, that we come and we ask for our ancestors and our objects back. I think that's important to help um, understand how incredibly important this issue is uh, for, for tribes. And, and so one of the things I like to start with by saying is that um, in this uh, case, dates and time are kind of irrelevant, okay? <laughs> um, a long time ago, <laughs> many, many years ago, our ancestors, um, they gave final rights to their loved ones and buried them in the ground. And it was meant to be in perpetuity. They were meant to stay there forever. Um, we were They were lovingly placed in the ground and given their last funeral rites, just as we do today with most of our loved ones. And um, given those, those rights to go to, on to the next world and given objects that were to be parting gifts. And unfortunately, um, we know that those items and those ancestors were not left, always left in the ground as such. And in, in my people, I'm Anishinaabe, and my people believe that our very last gift back to the earth for all the things that she's provided for us. So, so water, right? And, and lumber and oxygen and food and this beautiful land we live upon, all the things that she's provided us, medicine, animals, you know, flowers that are so beautiful. We've, we've been able to receive all of those gifts our entire lives. And so when we pass on our gift um, back to mother earth is, is our, ourselves. We go back to be part of mother earth. And um, that starts us on a beautiful journey to what we believe is, is um, the, next, the next path we take, right? And um, I'm sorry, I can't get into too many specifics on that, but, but you can imagine if you believe in any afterlife, it starts that journey to, the, to that next one. And unfortunately, when our ancestors are taken without consent, they're stolen from the land, um, it, it interrupts that journey. It interrupts the journey that they're on. And when that journey is interrupted, um, things happen in our communities that are felt and um, seen in different ways. It almost creates what we like to call a, a spiritual unrest. It creates chaos in our communities because our ancestors are not completing their journey as was intended. And because they were given ceremony to do so, um, that ceremony was interrupted, that journey was interrupted. And our ancestors um, oftentimes will be um, maybe stuck between worlds. And that creates um, feelings inside of those of us who are still here that we understand those, that spiritual unrest. And unfortunately, it also creates problems in our communities like drug and alcohol abuse, loss of identity, it's creating things like loss of language and our people are, are sick. We have higher rates of, of, of health disparities and we see a lots of suicide, domestic violence. And um, our women, um, especially have higher rates of violence. We have lack of resources too on our reservations. And so that doesn't help because we're, we're already at a disadvantage for lack of resources in some places. Plus we have um, the spiritual unrest happening. And so, um, as you can imagine, that that takes a toll on our people, right? We, we're losing people at higher rates. And our young people are not walking into this way of life as they should be. 
right? Because they're using drugs and alcohol and they've seen so much trauma at young ages. And so our elders talk of a time when we bring our ancestors home. And when we do so, when we're able to bring our ancestors home successfully, and we're able to rebury on our own tribal lands, and we're able to help them complete that original journey, that we bring healing back to our community. We bring healing back to spirit, to our ancestors, but that also brings healing into our modern day communities, helps to heal some of that void we're feeling or that our people are feeling. And so it's incredibly important to bring the ancestors and their objects home because it, it helps us to bring the extra level of healing that we can only get in our communities by returning those things by which we are taken and stolen without consent, right? So um, we, I like to talk about that. I like to set the tone in that way because I think um, we can talk about repatriation in a lot of ways, but I think it's important to talk about it in a spiritual way so that we really understand what that means for community. I don't think sometimes our, um, we're not willing to share that part of it. And, and I think that's the important part that really helps people understand that um, when, when, when tribal nations would like to bring their ancestors home, it really is about healing and not just healing um, physically, but spiritually. And so um, some of the things that I just spoke about higher rates of suicide, um, higher rates of health disparities, all of the things that our people are feeling um, in large part due to some spiritual unrest, right? Um, it's also the effects of ongoing colonization. And um, I wanna share some like pretty sobering statistics with you that will really just drive that point home about you know where our people are at. Um, so, so 84 or over 84% of American Indian and Alaska Native women, or basically four out of five women will experience violence in their lifetime. So if you can look at the, the zoomosphere we're in and see how many people are here, I mean, that's quite a few of us in this room that would experience violence, you know, um, in our lifetime. So the rate of like homicide for American Indians and Alaska Natives is more than double uh, the national average of all other races. Um, when you compare other races in the US, um, American Indians and Alaska Natives have a lower life expectancy of um, over five, five and a half years. And some health disparities that I mentioned earlier, um, American Indians and Alaska Natives have higher rates of heart disease, um, over 1.3 times higher than the national average. Cirrhosis of the liver uh, at 4.6 times higher than the national average. Um, any other chronic liver diseases as well are considered in that statistic. And intentional or self-harm or suicide uh, at a rate of almost two times higher than the national average. Where I live in particular, we have 12 federally recognized tribes in the state that I live in. And our state has a higher rate of suicide than the national average, but our state is broken into two, um, two parts. We have an upper peninsula and a lower peninsula. And our upper peninsula has, um, like the second um, highest rate of suicide in, in the country. So we, we feel that deeply where I live. And so more than one quarter of American Indian and Alaska native populations are living in poverty. That's more than double the rate of the general population. And there are places and reservations in this country that the rate is much higher in fact, there are places um, and reservations in this country where there are people living in poverty that's 40% higher than the national average. And so we see places that sometimes don't even have running water. And these are, um, these are mostly uh, statistics from 
national data that was collected. So um, I'm thinking that this would be on reservation land. American Indians and Alaska Natives um, are more likely to experience violent and traumatic events in their life or injury to themselves or others, but have the highest per capita rate of violence and victimization. So these are all things that aren't directly related uh, to, to um, our ancestors and objects not being returned, but they're spiritually related to that. There are things that are happening in our communities um, as a result of the spiritual unrest that has been created because we've lost our way, our connection, because our ancestors lost their way and their connection because they were taken from the ground without consent and not returned. So these are just things that are happening. I wanted to give you that bigger picture um, idea of, of what it looks like um, on tribal lands here and what it looks like and how it feels um, and, and why it's so important to talk about repatriation and have this discussion. Thank you. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about uh, why things are the way they are and the history of, uh, of, of what's gotten us to where we are today. Um, there's a series of, of United States Supreme Court cases that uh, still are carried out today as precedent and used as law. Um, that finds that even though tribes are, are sovereign in the United States and that they're self-determining bodies with inherent sovereignty to, to rule themselves, at the same time, they're inferior. Um, there's a, a doctrine called the doctrine of discovery, uh, which was used to justify the taking of, of lands in the United States. Uh, because the people who resided here were quote unquote heathen or non-Christian. And the doctrine of discovery uh, justifies the taking of heathen lands by Christian European peoples. And so um, that set up uh, a pattern of, of, of historic activity, law and policy that has diminished uh, indigenous peoples in the United States and has dispossessed us of the things that make us whole, right? So, so colonization was a pattern of removing uh, indigenous peoples, putting them on a reservation and taking uh, everything that was there before. So taking the things from their homes, the sacred objects, the objects used for for ritual and religious practices, the ceremonial objects, the cultural objects, uh, uh, considered cultural patrimony. So like the United States would consider the Declaration of Independence um, a, a, a item of cultural patrimony of national importance. Um, indigenous peoples had those same objects as well, objects of, of cultural patrimony. And of course their ancestors and their their funerary uh, belongings were dug up and used to really um, develop the science of archeology span and anthropology. And all of those items together were traded internationally and were brought back to, to European countries and had populated museums beyond probably what any of us know. What we do know today is the United States has recognized this dispossession and the harm that was caused by the taking of these objects uh, in a disparate way than how other people have been treated, right? Um, so it's not just a matter of, of protecting human rights, um, but also civil rights in the United States. So the United States passed a law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act that was meant to recognize that museums and federal agencies didn't rightfully possess all of the things that they have in boxes and behind glass. And, and it facilitates an administrative process of returning those items back to affiliated tribal nations. And, 
And that's not an easy feat. Uh, we know today that there are still, from what has been reported, there are still 116,000 human bodies still in boxes waiting to come home in the United States. Uh, we know there's millions of other types of cultural items in the United States that are part, uh, that should be part of that repatriation process uh, between museums, federal agencies, and, and indigenous tribes here in the United States. Um, and that's for uh, the 574 federally recognized Indian nations here. Uh, but there's also about 300 other indigenous groups that have not been recognized in the United States here. So the level of diversity and traditional cultural knowledge that uh, native peoples have in the US is immense. You know, and even with all the colonization and the policies that, that were created by the United States, which have been labeled by by Congress's genocide, uh, the kidnapping and taking of children, outlawing language and, and cultural and religious practices um, and other violence and, and, um, and takings and, and land dispossessions um, have been considered genocide by the US. Um, uh, we're still here. Uh, and we know that there's still a, a vast problem in the US and the world um, with the possession of our items, because there's still this thinking, this perception that, that Indian people are others, that native peoples are others um, and somehow um, can be treated differently than um, non-native peoples, that their bones can be studied without any you know, uh, free prior and informed consent, that their items, their cultural, their religious items, and even their funerary objects can be sold on the market without any um, uh, um, penalty. Uh, so there's still a lot to do. And part of that is just a, a matter of public education. In the US, uh, uh, our public schools only teach about Indians up to about 1900. So it freezes us in this time and space of the past. And then when you take those children to a museum and what they see are those items of the past without any understanding of who native people are today, um, it's kind of easy to uh, 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 figure out why. Uh, there's such uh, uh, disparate um, and, and racist thinking about who native people are. Uh, so uh, if we go a little deeper into what um, museums and research practices have done to perpetuate these kind of false notions of, of indigenous peoples. Uh, you know, we can look simply at what we what we actually see on on the walls um, and behind glass in those institutions when we walk in there. Um, and uh, I I I wanted to show you pictures. There's a museum called the Nel Nelson Atkins Museum in in Missouri, and this is a, a museum that has obligations under the Native American Graves Protection Act to repatriate um, these cultural items. Uh, but many of the items they, they have on loan, so they haven't taken into uh, the museum's possession, and they use that to obfuscate um, uh, what the law requires so that they're showing these important sacred and cultural objects and funerary objects in glass, uh, in these different glass cubbies all throughout the museum that have a simple label and maybe a story. But what's interesting and what we find when institutions practice repatriation 
in consultation and collaboration with indigenous nations is that the whole perception about what an institution shows to the public and is able to educate about indigenous peoples to the public is completely different. Um, it, it becomes an interactive collaborative uh, work that educates not by static historic past um, um, objects, but can bring in living peoples um, to talk about shared values and um, ways of looking at the world that's diverse from others. And that's um, what museums have found as an incredible journey with tribes when they work together with tribes is that they're actually now able to really fulfill their mission as an institution, where before all they could do was, you know, put up an object, tell a story that's often been um, marred over time and has never had the input of the peoples who that object belongs to, um, and, and uh, continue this uh, colon, colonized uh, racist uh, idea, often stereotypical of idea of who uh, diverse uh, native peoples are. Um, so uh, we want to talk about best practices. Uh, and, and some things institutions can do and hopefully have a discussion uh, among us all about any questions or concerns. Um, for example, uh, many institutions that we found internationally and domestically feel like they don't know how to reach out to origin communities. Uh, uh, find that a little bit intimidating and scary. Uh, and uh, we wanna talk a little bit about that if that's a concern. Uh, we wanna talk about how opening up um, collections and being transparent about the information that's contained in your institutions can create long lasting relationships and uh, educate uh, not just the museum, but can also educate and heal um, the indigenous peoples involved. Um, I'm gonna stop there for a minute, uh, make sure that uh, I'm not uh, missing something. Colleen may see that I, I, I might've missed or stepped over. Um, do you wanna summarize and we'll go to best practices? Yeah, thanks. Um... Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have anything to add. I just think um, we're even just, you know, painting that picture of, of what it looks like and, and how, you know, how these objects landed in institutions and how the, you know, the colonization and the racism and all that played a, a factor into that. And, um, and I think, um, I think we're ready to, to talk about best practices I think we've set the tone I think everyone understands the history and so I think this is a good time to move into best practices for institutions would you like to talk about the Carl, Carl sure. Nye example? yeah well there is a case study I could talk about that's it was an international repatriation with the Carl May Museum in um Radebeul, Germany does anyone know that institution know of that institution okay so so the Carl May Museum it's a it's a, you're, you're saying yes, you do know. Okay. Well, um, we, uh, I used to, like I said before, I was with the association. I used to be uh, the repatriation contact for my tribal nation. And so we got wind of some ancestors that were not only in the collection at Carl May, but on display. And so that began a process of reaching out to the institution and starting those conversations. And that was about seven years ago. And during that time, um, I, I won't say it was unheard of. I think there had been some international repatriations going on, but it was wildly unthought of at the time. And so of course our request for repatriation came as quite a shock. 
And um, there was a lot of news around that story and a lot of um, positive and negative press going on and lots of um, emotions. And so um, we were able to travel to the Karl May Museum, meet with the representatives. And I really wanted to talk about this case study so that I could share with you some things that worked well and some things that worked um, not so well. <laughs> and um, I think that's important, especially when we're talking about international repatriation. And so um, it was a it was a very generous invite um, from the museum and from the the city of Radabool to invite myself and an elder um, from our community to go out to um, to do ceremony with the ancestor there that we were requesting and to meet with city officials, to meet with the museum officials and to start to talk about what the process might look like or how we could collaborate for the future. And so the very first, um, the very first thing that the museum did was take the ancestors off display, which is, I think, a good faith effort. Um, however, they also had them replicated so that they could keep the replicas on display. So um, when we're before we move into best practices, let's talk about, you know, practices that are not the best. <laughs> and so that would be on the list replicating human remains. Um, unfortunately, that is um, the, the choice they made. And so um, we were happy to have the, the actual ancestors off display. And so um, at that time, that was kind of um, how we had to proceed. And the very first document we signed together was a, a memorandum of agreement that just stated that we were willing to be partners and to work together to continue the conversation. It didn't really have any specific dates or times, just more or less stating that we were um, both uh, my tribal nation and the museum were willing to work together. And throughout the next seven years, um, we had ongoing conversations. The museum had some turnover, so different directors, um, board members, things like that. Some were wildly against repatriation, some some felt differently, um, but unfortunately their governing board um, felt very strongly against repatriation for quite some time. And um, on our end, we had, we had brought in some tribal experts to create different documents to, to, show, um, to show quote unquote proof, right? Because the burden of proof was on our tribe. And um, Unfortunately, the, the information that we brought forward was not enough to, to, um, to show that that ancestor should be returned to our tribe, um, according to the museum's um, standards. And we didn't believe that the museum had provided us with enough information to say that the ancestor was not uh, related to our nation and should not be returned. And so we were almost at a standstill for quite some time until um, we both agreed that uh, a third party mediation should occur. And I think, I think that was a really great move um, for, for both parties involved. And so up until that point, some of the things that we, we dealt with is obviously time differences, right? So um, language differences, cultural barriers, things that you would expect in this situation. And um, I think that both parties were willing to work together. And so we're able to work through a lot of those issues just by being respectful and trying to understand, right? And um, I think there was commitment on both ends, regardless of staff turnover and regardless of how um, incredibly um, emotional the situation was. And I think the Carl May at the time didn't want to move forward and kind of set a precedent um, for their institution and others. So flash forward, we had the third party mediation and that was, um, the mediator was determined by both parties and ended up being um, someone from the State Department in the US. And obviously lawyers and all the things had to be involved in that decision. And it, the decision came back that there's no reason the ancestor shouldn't be returned, that we've given enough information. And, um, and so ultimately, um, once the State Department was involved and um, the museum opted out from working with our tribal nation and only worked with the State Department from that point forward, and they were willing to return our ancestor, 
um, that way through the through the hands of the State Department and then the State Department to us. And so um, we were able to return that ancestor just in last month. So um, it ultimately ended up being very successful. Um, that ancestor had a beautiful coming home ceremony and beautiful reburial, but um, seven years in the making and some things that I know we would have done differently, um, probably um, what would have ultimately been um, making it more diplomatic from the beginning and having the State Department involved instead of trying to negotiate um, between the museum and the, and the tribe. That didn't seem to, to work in, a, in the best way, although the tribe was very adamant about asserting its sovereignty as a, as a nation. And, um, and so there's that and, um, and just some of the, you know, the smaller things, communication barriers and, you know, emails trying to translate those and not understanding intent, right. And, and not understanding, I think created a little bit of um, confusion and maybe just um, potentially some, some hard feelings because, you know, things were just not conveyed um, in a way that that was um, easy to understand because of language and cultural barriers. And so ultimately, I think that the commitment on both ends really helped that process. And I think that's one thing I want to drive home is like that collaboration and that working togetherness and, and building that bond that could potentially be something in the future, um, working together. And I think that is part of best practices, right? That is something that we want to share as part of best practices is building collaboration, maybe even for future um, events at institutions or future exhibits um, or speaking engagements, things where you're able to you know, collaborate with the community that you're working with to return ancestors and objects. Right, and there are um, most of our, our countries here, if not all of our countries um, have signed on to various international covenants uh, that uh, like the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, International Convention on the Elimination of All, all Forms of Racial Discrimination, Convention on the Protection and Promotion of the Diversity of Cultural Expressions, and there's other types of regional um, and, and country conventions and laws that uh, recognize and protect uh, indigenous peoples and other people's rights to their culture and religious practices, and also the ability to maintain their culture and religious practices. And, and many of these um, conventions, and especially the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, expressly proclaim the ability to possess and have those items returned um, as part of, of of their human rights. And so I go to this, um, you know, when Colleen tells the story of, of the Carl May Museum, I'm just completely disgusted. <laughs> you know, I know it, it resulted in uh, a good thing, the ancestor came home, but the process by which it took to get there, the fact that the words uh, and, and the, the documentation were not enough to persuade um, Carl Mai to hand over um, ancestral remains. And was there a reason, Colleen, of why they wanted to maintain possession? Did they ever give a reason why? Well, I, I think from what I gather, and I don't know that we were explicitly told this, but just that they they didn't want to be in a position where they returned the ancestor to, to my tribal or my native nation. And um, then later on, someone, some other nation came and asked for the object. That was their, um, their kind of their, their um, excuse. But ultimately, um, we had received the support of NCAI through a resolution, which is almost every native nation in the U.S. So we had provided them with um, ample proof that that wouldn't happen. Right. Uh, well, and what we've found um, with many institutions domestically and internationally, that's often an excuse um, that's used, but there's no, um, uh, there's no meat there. There's nothing like that that has ever occurred uh, 
where uh, another tribal nation has went out and tried to um, uh, make uh, institution legally uh, responsible for a repatriation. In fact, um, tribes uh, uh, more often than not support one another in these repatriation efforts. But, but what I like to refer to is there's this great thing in the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, a defined term called right of possession. And uh, I should have brought it up, but, but it essentially says that repatriation is supposed to occur unless the institution can prove by a preponderance of the evidence that it has the right of possession. And the US law defines right of possession as at the time of taking that whoever took the item or the ancestor had the basically the free prior and informed consent of the authoritative body or individual who had the right to allow those items to be taken or those ancestors to be dug up. That unless an institution has that right of possession, they don't have any ownership, possessory or other rights and they must return and repatriate to affiliated tribes. And I think that is kind of at the top of our list when we talk about what are best practices. Do you know how, your, how these items came to be in your collections? Did they have the free prior and informed consent of the peoples that they were taken from? And um, how can that historic harm be corrected. And I think if you look at repatriation and reparation for historical harms that have been done that continue to cause um, historical and intergenerational trauma, that if you can look from that lens, um, the things that happen with Karl Mai would not happen in your institution because you're understanding that that you do not have rightful possession of these, of these items. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, about best practices. And we talked a little bit about how to reconceptualize the purpose of a museum um, and how many institutions continue to perpetuate this colonial mindset of who indigenous peoples are that has created the stereotypes and has created this kind of other mentality that somehow it's okay for us to study these others and we can look at their naked forms behind glass and that's okay. Um, of course, we wouldn't do that to our own Likely we wouldn't do that to our own relatives or ancestors, but for some reason it's okay to look at it uh, to, and to look at their items in this way. So uh, best practices requires us to reconceptualize what is the mission and purpose of our institution? Is it to perpetuate that kind of, those kind of ideas and ideals, or is it to build relationships? and proffer um, public education and appropriate research that's done in collaboration with the items and people that you wanna work with, right? Um, uh, is it okay anymore to work unilaterally uh, with, for research and um, exhibitions uh, for these types of, of objects? Um, again, we want to focus on exhibits that are made in collaboration and with the consent of Indigenous peoples that protects and sustains cultural heritage. So oftentimes, many of the things, I mean, institutions have millions and millions of objects, many that will never see the light of day, many beyond the capacity for the institution to even appropriately handle. Um, and what some institutions in the U.S. have said with uh, repatriation is that it's freed up dollars. It's allowed them to remove collections that were not doing anything 
um, free up dollars so that they actually could produce um, the types of exhibits and the collaborative um, working relationships that are needed to provide better public education so that there were positive benefits to actually um, deaccessioning items that, that were, not, were not in use. And, and with that, um, there's all sorts of, 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 of legal relationships that can happen between indigenous peoples or origin communities and the institution. Um, it, because many tribes uh, in the US, for example, like Colleen's tribe, they want the ancestor back and they want to, to rebury it. There are some tribes in the United States that want to do scientific research uh, to help them understand more about, about uh, who they are as people. And that's, that's their belief. So not all indigenous peoples want everything back and nothing touched for research. But you don't know that unless you build a relationship with and you understand um, how that those indigenous peoples or indigenous nations, how they see their sovereignty and self-determination. Um, uh, we believe that we all must change our research protocols. We need high due diligence requirements regarding research, trade, sale, exhibition of cultural heritage items, and that, and that the, the standards should be free prior and informed consent of the, uh, the, the items owners, the true owners of, of, of those items. Uh, we also see that many of, of items in the US have been loaned or traded internationally. Um, even uh, if you all are aware of the National Museum of the American Indian, I'm gonna quit here just a minute, National Museum of the American Indian before it was that. It was the American Indian Institution, American Indian Museum. Before that, it was the High, High Indian Museum. And that institution was known to have the largest collection. And there's pictures of, of the items and the bodies um, that, that used to be in shelves, um, uh, not well protected um, in that institution. And it was out of that institution that created many of the collections around the world. So many institutions traded um, items with the, the Indian Museum. And also anthropologists, archeologists, dealers, and sellers of those items also traded with that museum. So every once in a while, you'll see something come up at Sotheby's with an Indian Museum tag on it. Um, in fact, we, we just did, there were some Inuit items that um, were for sale at Sotheby's. So we see this, this, this trade and, and this, this idea that these items are okay to trade and sell, um, you know, come out of museums and go into the market. Um, and that's why it's important, not just for institutions, but also people who are dealing in antiquities to understand a higher level of due diligence when, when um, uh, agreeing to sell these types of items. Because there are other laws that many um, institutions don't, aren't even aware of that, that could apply. Um, Sorry, Shannon, uh, um, we just have nearly 10 minutes left in this session. So I just want to leave time for some questions. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and really the last, the last part is about healing that happens, not just for indigenous peoples, but also for institutions releasing that burden of, of that historic past. Uh, and we've seen um, uh, so much of that happen in the United States through work under NAGPRA. So I'll stop there and um, happy to talk and um, Okay, thank you both so very much. That was really very interesting and very insightful and I think gives us a lot to, to think about. Um, would anyone have any questions that they'd like to ask Shannon and Colleen? You can just unmute yourself or raise your hand or put a question into the chat. <laughs> 
Uh, maybe I'll say something of reflection and question as well. I might be the only other American here other than Shannon and Colleen, non-Native American, obviously. But I think, you know, when you talked about the importance of teaching history beyond 1900, I think, you know, I'll just share an experience I had as a child, and I think it's not uncommon uh, for a lot of Americans. But, you know, growing up, you, you, you see kind of Native Americans being represented in popular culture and, and so forth but you don't really see them as existing communities in the present day. And I remember it was maybe like fifth or sixth grade. Um, this girl that was sitting next to me all of a sudden told me she was Anishinaabe. I think she said more specifically a certain band of Chippewa. And that was like the first time that light went on. It's like, wow these communities are still very much existing. And I'm thinking for people who don't have that personal connection to, to, to make with a, someone from a native community, it could be very easy to think they don't exist anymore. And if they don't exist anymore, you don't need to worry about them. So I think education is very important. But the question is, so you mentioned of obviously, you know, the implication is that the museums have an obligation at least at the very least to have an honest and open discussion about repatriation, about education. Do you think that, are there any other obligations of museums that you would like to see happening? Go ahead, Colleen, if you have. <laughs> well, that's a good question. Um, and I don't know that I'm the, always the best person to um, ask that question. Uh, in fact, uh, no, in a presentation several months ago, someone asked me the same question and my response was, I'd like to see no Native American objects on display, nothing. Don't tell a story that's not yours to tell unless you're willing to consent with the tribes. And so I guess from my perspective, like the obligation is always to form that relationship. But I also will challenge any museum to not only form that um that relationship with the native nation of which the objects that you have are, you know, come from, but also be part of it, go visit there, right. Form not just form a relationship, but if you're willing to, you know, if you're going to be telling the story in your museum, you ought to really know what that story is. Um, and, and so I guess maybe I'm not always the best one to ask, cause I'd like to see nothing. I don't think a museum is a place to tell our story. Never has been, never will be. Our communities are the place where those stories are told, but um, I might be coming from a pretty biased perspective. I think Claudia has a question from Vienna. Claudia, yes, she had a question, but uh, then she posted a message to say that they have a fire alarm in their building, oh. so she's had to leave the building, unfortunately. Um, but we do have a question here from uh, Meva asking, what are the major improvements in practice of NAGPRA in the past 30 years? And are there any reasons to be optimistic? So that's quite Yes, it's, it's been difficult. In fact, we're undertaking a, a process right now of, of uh, reconceptualizing and redrafting the NAGPRA regulations, which implement uh, the statute. Uh, the, the, the regulations have really caused a lot of, of problems uh, and have allowed museums and institutions to not fulfill their responsibilities under the law uh, created a lot of loopholes. So right now we're reconceptualizing that. So I think there's a lot of, of reason to be hopeful and optimistic. Um, and a lot has changed really in the last 10 years. So where we were 20 years out to where we are today seems completely different. And I think it's because of the changeover of people who work in museums. The people who are taking over museums now um, are younger, they've had education in NAGPRA. They have been brought up understanding that, that these items um, um, aren't theirs and that there's a process for uh, returning them versus the people who, who were in their positions before who were the ones that collected and held on to those ideas of, of of native peoples um, uh, without um, any kind of moral or 
uh, feeling they didn't have a legal obligation to, to comply with. So the changeover in people, I think, have, has really been uh, one of the strongest things that has helped move us in the right direction. Thanks so much, Shannon. Uh, Karen, you wanted to make mm. a comment? Uh, yes. Um, hi, everybody. And thank you so much, Colleen and Shannon. I'm, um, I'm an educator uh, at the same museum as Ifa and, and Michael. Um, and yes, I, I've been working here for a very, very long time. And um, uh, Colleen, what you told me about uh, the re repatriation of human remains um, you know, in, and uh, all those sp spiritual uh, issues, it reminds me a lot of what happened here in Stockholm in 2004, when a group from uh, uh, Aboriginal Australia, the Kimberleys, came here to, maybe you heard about it, um, to uh, get back human remains from a Swedish expedition, which were really, really brought there. I mean, they, they, they broken every, every not just every law, of course, but even at that time, but also, um, and, and this Aboriginal delegation, they um, made it so clear to us uh, what it really meant, this um, crime in, uh, in their culture, in their spirituality, and also what it meant to, to the actual land there in Kimberley. Um, and, they gave a, a ceremony, a ritual here, a um, purifying smoke ritual. And uh, of course, this was a result uh, of a long relation uh, with researchers, both in, in Sweden and, and Australia. And also before that, it, a very long process with the totem pole from the Heisler people in British Columbia, uh, uh, when they get an old totem pole back, but then gave as a gift to, to Sweden uh, a new totem pole, which was made here. You can see it outside our museum building. And that created a lot of new and very, very um, good relations with the carvers from the Raven clan, the actual owners of the, the old totem pole from the Eagle clan, etc. So, uh, and even if the, we don't have the old token pole here and we don't have the human remains, thanks a lot that we don't have them, uh, but we can tell, me and as, as an educator can, can tell these stories, can keep the relation with, uh, relations with some of, of these people from, from Australia and the Heisler people. And that's, it means so much to, to be a part and, and I told like thousands of, of students uh, and kids, etc., about this. So the history is like very alive and, and we, we don't want to, um, to, to hide these uh, dark stories. So I, I just wanted to give it, and, and I, I can relate to a lot of things that you say, but from another perspective, of, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you for sharing those are uh, shining examples of exactly what we we're talking about here. So I think that's a, a perfect way to, to end our conversation today. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, one last thing. We do have our seventh annual repatriation conference coming up. You can see behind me. It's the November 3rd, 10th, and 17th. I did drop the link in the chat. We would love for you to join us. Um, please go to the, to the link in the chat and you'll be able to get our registration form. Um, and there's also a scholarship form there. Um, in case you qualify for a scholarship, please apply. And we'd love to have you all there. And this kind of conversation we're having today will also be part of the, um, the conference and many other discussions on different repatriation issues. So just wanted to let you all know. Um, thank you very much um, for joining us today in the Zoomosphere. Um, I hope you have a great afternoon. Um, just wanted to say miigwech and miyu. Just thank you for listening.
and, and we will see you in some of the other uh, workshops. Thank you both so very much. Um, I do wish we had longer <laughs> that we could talk more. But yes, like you said, we can talk hopefully more about certain uh, parts of this within uh, the workshop and maybe tomorrow, even if you're able to join us. So yes. we're going to take a 15 minute break now. Um, again, the link will stay open so you can just turn off your microphones and your cameras. And if you want to be back in 15 minutes, but thank you again, sincerely to, to Colleen and to Shannon. It really was very, very interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.